Welcome to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God podcast, an in-depth study of the Word of God. The program's name is from Romans 12, 2, which says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Welcome to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God podcast. At the time of this recording, we are in January 2023, and so I would want to wish each and every one of you a happy new year. We pray that you had a wonderful holiday, that you were blessed by God in some way. And if you woke up, you were indeed blessed. We thank you for being a listener. We pray for you. We intercede on your behalf and we thank you for listening to the program. And we're going to get into continuing our study and our verse by verse chapter by chapter study of the word of God in the New Testament. We left off on last year in 2022, we started in the book of John out of the New Testament, chapter one, verse one, and we finished chapter seven. And we're going to pick up in this year and John chapter eight and continue to go until we complete the entire book of John. And then we'll move on to the books of act, the book of Acts and keep on going into the Lord say Otherwise, but before we get into today's program, as I always like to remind you that you can listen to past, present and future episodes on our website at Renew Your Mind Ministries, that's T-R-I-E-S at the end of ministries dot org. That's Renew Your Mind Ministries dot O-R-G. So if you missed any of the past episodes and want to go back and get caught up, or you just want to look at any particular subject because they're broken down on there on the various where we are in the particular book and what verses that's covered. So if you want to, if you miss any particular chapter from chapter one through chapter seven, you can go back and listen to that particular episode or all of the episodes. And if we, you can also find us on podcasting streaming services such as Spotify, Apple or iTunes, uh, Google podcasts you can tell your alexa smart speaker to play the podcast play renewing your mind with the word of god podcast iheart anywhere you can listen to a podcast we should be there not only this podcast the renewing your mind with the word of god podcast but you can also find i our two other podcasts that's the god revelation podcast where we're taking a verse by verse Chapter by chapter study of the book of Revelation, as I always like to say, that book of that's being the book of Revelation. And what is being revealed is the glorious return of our Lord and Savior Jesus to this earth a second time as king. And the third podcast that you can find on our website, as well as any podcasting platform, that is the God Revelation excuse me, the Holy Spirit podcast where we're taking an in-depth look at the third person of the Holy of the Holy Trinity. That's the Holy Spirit. So you can check out all three and I encourage you to listen and go back and to any of those podcasts, as well as you can find a link to those podcasts on our Facebook page at Facebook dot com forward slash renew your mind ministries I N C again, that's facebook.com renew your mind ministries. I N C. And as I always like to do, encourage you to share the podcast with others, believers and non-believers. We are commanded by our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ to spread the good news of his death, burial and resurrection into all of the earth. And you can do your part by sharing or telling someone about this podcast and our other podcasts. I pray that you're being blessed by these podcasts, by our teaching. And so if you're being blessed, others can be blessed as well. And they may not know about these podcasts. So tell them there's nothing. It didn't cost them anything. It didn't cost you anything to tell them about these podcasts. It didn't cost them anything to listen to the podcast. And you may, and you never know what may lead, what may come out of sharing these podcasts with others. A non-believer may come to faith through listening to that podcast by you telling them, and that will be credited to your account according to God's word. So please do so. Please tell others about the podcast. Now, 
Let's go to, if you have not already done so, let's go to open up your Bible to John chapter 8. Oh, before we move on, if you need to reach me for prayer, I can be emailed at renewyourmind, the letter M as in Mary, at gmail.com. That's renewyourmind, the letter M at gmail.com. Or you can write me, I am Brother Arnold, your host and teacher. I can be reached at P.O. Box 721143, Jackson, Mississippi, 39272. Again, that's P.O. Box 721143, Jackson, Mississippi, 39272. Or you can email me. Again, I'm Brother Arnold, and I would love to pray for you. And I have been praying for you collectively, but if you email me, I can pray for you specifically. Not that my prayers would um, reach God before yours, but the word also commands us to pray for one another. So I would like to do that. All right. So if you have not already done so, please open your Bible to chapter eight out of the New Testament. That's the gospel of John chapter eight. And John, it, the author of this book is John, one of the original disciples of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He wrote this book along with John's one, two and book, John's books of John one and two, as well as the book of Revelation and John three. So. Uh, If you have not already done so, please open your Bible to the book of John chapter eight. And we're going to read verses one through eleven. Then we're going to come down and break down each one of those verses. We're going to pray and then we're going to break down each one of those verses. So if you would, let's go there and let me go there myself. And I'll be reading from the NIV version. So your particular wording may be different depending on which version you are. Are reading, And as I always like to remind you, if you are reading a version of the Bible, particularly the King James Version, where they it was written in old King English, in which that's the way they spoke and wrote during that time. And you don't understand the dials and the these. You do not have to struggle through that. You can get updated um, translation into the without losing its meaning or changing its meaning of English and way we speak it now. I like the NIV. Uh, there are other versions out there. Just stay away from paraphrasing because paraphrasing, you don't get a word for word translation from the original Hebrew, Greek and Aramaic in which the Bibles, the books of the Bibles were written in. You get someone interpretation of what they believe and you have to always be cautious of getting someone paraphrasing instead of a word for word translation from English uh, from the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic into our standard way of English that we talk today, where you can read the word of God and understand it and not have to figure out the D's and the thousands because we don't talk like that anymore. Uh, but at once upon a time, people did. And so when they first printed the Bible, they printed in the King James. And for a long time, it was a standard bearer and still a good uh, book if you can understand it. Uh, but if you don't understand it or it's slowing down your reading and it's thus slowing down your comprehension or may frustrate you, go to a different translation that using that is using updated uh, English, as it were. All right, let's start with chapter eight, verse one. And I'm going to actually uh, verse one. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives at dawn. He appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Verse number three, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery and the law. Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now, what do you say? Verse number six. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Verse seven. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse number eight. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this time, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Verse number 10. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Have no one condemned you? Verse 11. No, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just thank you and we just praise you for being our God. Thank you. We just so grateful in this moment that you would create us. And as believers chose us to believe in your son, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior and offering salvation to unbelievers 
that he died for their sins and that you raised him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit because he was perfect, sinless, making him the perfect sacrifice for our sins, which you demanded. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for obeying the Father even unto death, offering up your sinless, perfect, godly blood for our lives, our sins. Thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And we ask by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would open up our minds, our hearts and our ears to better receive and understand your word and apply it in our life. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to see in this episode what's commonly called the woman caught in adultery. And as the passage just alluded to, this was a trap set by the Pharisees because let's back up. Let's back up into what happened in verse number chapter seven. That's leading up to this. Jesus had gone to one of the Jewish festivals had gone to Jerusalem, which was commanded by the law, the Jewish law, in which they was under the, the festivals of Booth. And he was teaching at the temple and. And he was telling the people that he was the bread of life and that he was in essence telling them that he was going to die for their sins. And the Pharisees had sent the temple guard to arrest him, but they were so compelled by his witness and probably because they were afraid of the people that they did not arrest him. And the people were, according to the God's word, was divided about Christ in which they're still today. Some believe that he was indeed the Messiah. Others thought that he was uh, an evil person, a faker, and which is still the case today. And. And they're wrong in believing that, but that's still deep. Jesus still divide. The opinion over Jesus is still divide. And that's true. It's, it was true then. And it's true today. He was the Messiah. Then he's the Messiah today. And that's true as well. And his word is true today as it was then. And always would be true. Nonetheless, uh, that the temple God has returned to the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders of the Jews without Jesus. They sent them. They just sent Jesus to be arrested. They come back without Jesus. They was infuriated that the guard came back without Jesus. And they had a tantrum tantrum because the Pharisees did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They wanted to kill him because he had broken their man-made law of not um, of healing on the Sabbath and other things. And probably more so the jealousy because Jesus and his miracles was and his, it was spreading throughout the land. His popularity was spreading throughout the land. People were talking about Jesus and they weren't talking so much about the Pharisees and they were just jealous. And so they wanted to kill him and they was bringing him back. They wanted him arrested so they could try to execute their plan to arrest him. And so that's kind of a backdrop. I would encourage you to go back and listen to the past episodes. And here we pick it up that Jesus has returned back to the, the temple to start teaching. And then the Pharisees just try to set up a trap by saying, hey, they've caught this woman in adultery. What are you going to do about it? What's your opinion about it? So we're going to see how Jesus addresses that. All right. So let's get to it. The woman caught in adultery. Um, verse number one. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So after this discord of explaining to the people that he was the bread of life and that he would have springs of water, basically um, explaining salvation. Uh, the people left and Jesus and went, they went home. That's what the previous verse or just how chapter seven ended. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And so that's what that verse is saying. Let's move on to verse number two of John chapter eight. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Again, there's a lot of people in the city because it's the booths, the festival of booths and of the Jews that were not living in Jerusalem or were required to come back to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of booths. So you have a lot of people in the city. And so he had taught the day before he's coming back after going to the Mount of Olives to teach again the temple. And that's when these Pharisees bring this woman and say, hey, what about that? So let's move on. That's what that's talking about. Verse number three. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery and adultery. They made her stand before the group. The religious leaders are attempting to trap Jesus here. This is meant to be a public as possible so that Jesus response can be given as much publicity as possible. Because what they're trying to do is if he says the wrong thing, they can make charges against him to the Romans, because during this time, the nation of Israel is being occupied and controlled by the Roman Empire, like a lot of um, areas during this time. So they're, they're not governed by themselves. They're not free from the governance of others. So they have to follow the rules of the Romans. And they know the Romans have certain things about execution rules about who can be executed. No one can be executed without their permission. And so at the same time, the Jewish law 
and it's found in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, which we're going to look at shortly, demanded uh, stoning by death by certain offenses. So they're trying to catch Jesus in this trap, and they had tried to set up previous traps, traps for Jesus, but Jesus being God and being led by the Holy Spirit, they couldn't do that, and they're not, never going to be able to do that. He was going to always escape them because he, God... Father, God, God, the Father had set an appointed time for him to die, and that he was not going to be killed in such time as that appointed time had come. But they didn't know that, and so they're setting these traps, and he's going to get out of this trap just like he's gotten out of all the others because these humans in their era, they just can't help themselves and not realize they're dealing with God, Jesus. All right, so let's move on to verse number four. And said to them, it's picking it up, these are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to Jesus in verse number four, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And we're going to read verse number five as well for continuity. And the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now, what do you say? Now, here's the trap when they say, now, what do you say? So they've already played in their mind. If he says this, then we got him. If he say this, then we have him either way. So they, in their mind, it's a catch 22. We're going to have him one way or the other. Ha. But Jesus has different has a different plan for them. All right. The use of the term teacher here is probably meant to be sarcastic. In other words, these Pharisees and teachers of the law couldn't stand Jesus. That, um, typically, they would have used the word rabbi, but they understood the significance of and the respect that's carried with the word rabbi. So they they probably clenched their teacher and said teacher because they had no interest in Jesus as a teacher. Again, they're doing this sarcastically trying to, you know, front for the people, but they hated Jesus and they hated to call him teacher. They hated to call him rabbi, but it was the, that was the most polite thing they probably could say while they're setting this trap up. Jesus is speaking to the crowd and the Pharisees are looking at a way to discredit him with his followers. So as they bring this guilty woman into the area and throw her in the middle of the crowd, it's unlikely that the woman was caught in the act, if you will, mere moments prior to being dragged directly in front of Jesus. More than likely, this woman who had been previously found out and carefully chosen by the Pharisees in advance to try to trap Jesus. In verse number five, the Pharisees point out the Old Testament law, which required the death penalty for adulterers. What they would fail to mention, though, is the law did not merely require that they stone just the woman, but they should stone both guilty parties. And we see nowhere in this context that they brought the man that she was having that she committed adultery with. It takes two to commit adultery. Where is the man? But yet the law in which these Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the Jewish leaders were trying to trap Jesus in, weren't following the whole the law, whole law. They were trying to pick and choose a the, their, the law and bend the law to suit them. Now, these Pharisees, let's put it in context as we talked about before. These were the learned men. These were supposed to be the teachers of the law that knew the law. And we're te- and supposed to be teaching others. So they knew that the law of Moses in which they're referring to required that both the man and the woman be stoned to death. But yet what? They only presented the woman. So they are in error themselves. They're trying to trap Jesus by using the law and they're violating the law itself. As a matter of fact, let's specifically go to the Leviticus 2010 and Deuteronomy 22, 22. And let's look at that. Which it says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. Leviticus says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. But yet we see the Pharisees are breaking the very law they're trying to trap Jesus with because the man is not there. It was only the woman. In other words, they're trying to prove their allegiance to the law because they're trying to trap Jesus with the law. And these men are falling short of the law themselves because they didn't bring the guilty man as well. Because if she was caught in the act, they caught her with the man. So they know who he was or is. But they didn't bring him in there. They brought the woman because they're not really concerned about the law. They're not concerned about following Moses' law. They're concerned about 
protecting their own political power with the people and maintaining the status quo of their power and dealing with this figure in the form of Jesus getting him out the way so things can go back to normal and people can stop talking about him and and get him out the picture in, in their minds this is the way to accomplish this thus their goal is to trick Jesus into making one of two mistakes as they see it Jesus can either stone the woman and ruin his reputation for mercy you can check that out in Matthew 11 and 19 and putting himself at legal risk for Roman law prohibits Jewish leaders from using the death penalty. John 18, 31. Or he can refuse and defy the law of Moses. So it's either defy the law of Moses and in the view of the people become a lawbreaker himself or say stone her and violate the Roman law, which prohibit the death penalty without their approval. So that's how they that's the trap. That's the trap they're setting for him. Violate the Jewish law or violate the Roman law. So in their mind, there's no in between, but they will find differently. All right, let's go to verse number six in John chapter eight. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. However, Jesus does not take the bait. Interestingly here, Jesus says nothing at first. Instead, he begins to write on the ground. That's interesting. The Bible does not say exactly what Jesus is writing. Some speculate he's writing the exact Old Testament quote these men are citing. But we just talked about the Leviticus 2010 or Deuteronomy 2022. 22 22 where it says both the man and the woman has to be stoned but yet they're only presenting the woman here and if and again this is speculation but we know he's writing something and what he's writing is significant the bible does not tell us that he stooped down first he did not say anything but he wrote first and then he would go back to writing for no reason because we don't see jesus writing anywhere else in the in the word of god not to say he didn't but they're pointing to the significance of him writing on the word on the on the ground and so why they don't tell us that and what i'm saying is speculation but possibly because again if he is writing if the speculation if the speculation is right that jesus is writing these exact old testament that they're trying to trap him with about the stoning of adultery and they don't have the man there and if he's quoting it exactly and they're reading because if he's writing something, because all this is about Jesus, the attention on Jesus. So you best believe whatever he was writing, they are reading it as he's writing it. They're standing there watching him read it, everybody, because all this is about Jesus. So if he's writing something, they're reading it. And if he's reading the exact quote from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they're seeing and they should know, because, again, these are the learned man, the Jewish uh, leaders, the Pharisees, these were the, the college educated one. These were the ones who were educated in what we would call the Old Testament, the Jewish law and the Old Testament books. So they know the law. They know Deuteronomy. They know Leviticus. So they know that it should be both the man and woman. So if he's writing that they're, they're seeing this and then at the same time, they're contemplating that we're violating, like, we're violating the law because we should have both guilty parties here and we don't. Another speculation that what Jesus is writing, that he's writing the names of, the, of his critics along with their own sin. In other words, if they're talking about adultery, and this again, this is speculation, but whatever he's writing is important and they're reading it. And eventually they're going to get the message because we're going to, as we, as this unfold, it's significant what he's writing, even though the word didn't tell us what he's writing. But I've heard some speculate that he may have been writing since these men were uh, saying that she was caught in the very act of adultery that some of them probably had been committing adultery and yet not been caught. And what Jesus could have very well been doing is writing down their name, John and Mary, Paul and Sue and so forth and so on. And by, and while others may not have known they was committing adultery last night or the night before, when they see those names, those women or their name connected with those women, those wheels start turning in their mind. Um, yeah, we have this woman here committing, trying to stone her for committing adultery, but yet I was doing it last night, and he's just wrote the name of the woman I was doing it with last night or the day before or a week ago. Because by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus know what they've been doing, you know, because their hands are unclean, like all our hands are unclean. You know, we talk about the Pharisees and we put them down as we should, but we have to also examine ourselves. 
You know, we'd probably be the Pharisees. If we were back in the day, we'd probably be the Pharisees. And we also have unclean hands. That's a side note. But nonetheless, Jesus is writing something important on that ground. And best believe they are reading it. Another uh, speculation is that Jesus may be writing a question. Where is the man who who was also caught in the act with this woman. And again, everybody's reading that. And so he is starting to build doubt in these men's mind. Okay, all right, this may not be, we may not be on solid ground as we think we are. But that's important that the scripture um, states that he didn't speak first, but he started writing. But those are, in a way, those are nonetheless speculation, but they're important. Whatever he was writing, they were reading it, and it was important. All right, let's move on to verse number seven. When they kept on questioning him, but the, we noticed they, that didn't, whatever they was reading, it didn't stop them questioning him. They, they went on. They continued to question him. He straightened up. That's Jesus and said to them, let he or any one of you, he is who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. As always, Jesus responds, cut through the trap. They've tried to trap him before and he's gotten out of it. They're trying to trap him this time. He's going to get out of it because he's God and they're falling Man and fallen man cannot overcome God. Jesus points out one of the areas where his critics are themselves falling short of the law. The accusers are supposed to be the one to begin the execution. And what I'm referring to here is that another aspect of the Jewish law that they're trying to catch Jesus in, they're violating. According to Deuteronomy 17, 7, that's chapter 17, verse 7, and let's read it. The witness to the adultery are supposed to be the first one to throw the stone. Let's read it. It says, verse Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 7. The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting that person to death. Then the hands of all the other persons, all the other people should follow. So in other words, while they're bringing this woman to Jesus and saying she's been caught in the act of, of adultery one they violated the law because the man should be there with her because she didn't commit adultery with herself and then two if they were indeed the witnesses instead of ask, asking jesus his opinion they should have been following the law by being the first one to cast the stone against this woman instead of throwing her in front of jesus in front of all these people and saying hey what what do you say follow the law if you called her you should be the first one to the, the cast a stone and if it wasn't you who was a witness where are the witnesses so they can be the first one to cast the stone so again jesus is showing them and the people understand the same thing you're trying to trap me by setting me up to be in violation of the law why don't you're not following the law that you're trying to use to trap me in one by not having the other person here who was caught in the act with this woman and then two if you were the witnesses you Pharisees, if y'all witnessed this act, y'all said y'all caught in the mere act of adultery. Why hadn't you? Why hadn't you all? Because you, you know she's guilty. You said she was caught in the act. There's no rumors and no it, it's, it's concrete. She's guilty. Why hadn't you all, if you all were the one who caught in the act, thrown the four stones? Or if you all weren't the witnesses, where are the witnesses against this woman to throw the stones against her? There was no witnesses there. In blunt terms, Jesus is saying, if you're going to appeal to the law, then go ahead and follow the law yourself. And they were not doing it. Further, when Jesus led, says, let he who is without sin be the first to cast the first stone. Going back to what I was saying earlier, some of those men in that crowd knew while they were trying to get Jesus to condemn this woman, they were guilty of adultery themselves. And that's why we're eventually going to see that they started backing off after Jesus make these comments. All right, let's move on to verse number eight of John chapter eight. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Again, the word doesn't tell us what he wrote, but it was impactful on these men. And for continuity, let's read verse nine with that. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. When Jesus writes on the ground and challenges their approach, the men turn and leave. Not only do they fail to ruin Jesus' reputation with the people, they actually make him look even wiser. Because, again, there wasn't just the Pharisees and the, the woman caught in, adul in adultery in Jesus. Jesus was in the temple. There are people, all these bystanders that have, that's watching this unfold. So, And they know how the Pharisees were. 
They know how conniving they were and petty they were. And so when Jesus was able to outsmart them, he made their, their he turned what they meant for evil for good among these people. Also notice who left first, the older ones first. I wonder why. Maybe because those older men had longer life experiences and in the course of those life experiences like we all have, have sinned. Probably particularly had more adultery under their belt than the younger men because the younger men hadn't lived long enough. And knowing their background, they had to leave first. I know they left first because they knew their hands were unclean as well why they're trying to set this trap for jesus all right let's move on to verse number 10 which says jesus straightened up and asked her woman where are they has no one condemned you and we're going to read verse to final verse number 11 together for to keep in the context no one sir she said then neither do i condemn you jesus declared go now and leave your life of sin jesus question here sets up his response in the next verse. This is an instance of forgiveness, not ignorance. Jesus does not tell the woman, you did nothing wrong. He does not say, don't worry about what you did. Instead, Jesus Jesus simply states that he does not condemn her, which in this context refers specifically to stoning her for this particular sin. And also explicitly telling her not to sin anymore because he he didn't because she was caught in the act. That was not question. There was no doubt about it. And as the saying, as Jesus said, he without the, he without sin cast the first stone where well, that was something someone in the crowd that fit that criteria. That was Jesus. Jesus could have condemned her. He was without sin. He was the first, he could have been the first one to stone her, but he showed compassion on her. But at the same time, he recognized that she was in she was in sin. And so he did not ignore the sin. He showed forgiveness and mercy. But he said, what? Leave this sinful life. In short, Jesus showed this woman spectacular grace while still holding firm and calling her adultery what it was. A moral failure which should not be repeated. Jesus shows mercy while still speaking out against sin. This is an, is an example for us today. Having the right to do something does not mean it's the best option. Sometimes the right thing to do is to be a little bit softer, a little bit gentler, and more forgiving than the world. But at the same time, calling out sin. This is our time. We thank you. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for this time to just read your word. Lord, I just love your word. I love you. I just thank you for this time to study your word. I thank you for all the listeners, Father God, to just lift them up. Interceding on behalf of whatever the needs are, Father. You know what the needs are more than anybody. You know what the needs are even before they knew. And so we thank you that you're a great God that knows everything. We thank you that you will supply all our needs according to your riches and glory and, and your will. We thank you. We praise you. Now, if you have not accepted, if you're listening to this program, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, now is the time to do it. Just like he showed mercy to that woman who was caught in adultery, he can show mercy to you if you accept him as your Lord and Savior. And he wants that. He wants to show you mercy. He wants to be your Lord and Savior. He died for you. He was beaten to a pope. He was strung up high, had nails hammered into both hands and to his feet, and he died on that cross for you. And the only thing he asks you to do is believe. He's grace. His salvation is offered by grace, meaning that we're not deserving of it. We're not deserving. We all are flawed, just like that woman they caught in adultery. All of us have unclean hands. And nowhere in God's word does he say, if you do A, B, and C, if you stop smoking, you stop doing adultery, you can get, you can get into heaven. There's nothing we can do. We, we, we can't earn it. We're always going to fall short. Even if we get it right today, we know we're not going to get it right tomorrow or the next year. But, and so he didn't ask us to do that because he know in our human flesh we are weak and can't do it. And so the only thing he says is put your faith in me. Confess me as your Lord and Savior and I will forgive you. 
I will wash away your sins and never remember them anymore. He says from the east, from the west, I would never remember. The two would never meet. East and west never meet. And so if that's you today, now is your opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because tomorrow is not promised to you. The next five minutes is not promised to you. The next five seconds is not promised to you. So take this opportunity to now to confess him. And if that's you, please, boy, girl, ma'am, sir, take this opportunity to repeat this prayer after me. If you feel it in your heart, if you feel that tug in your heart to do so and you believe it, say this prayer with me. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, to die for my sins. I confess that and I believe that in my heart. I thank you that you raised him from the dead because he was sinless. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins. I am a sinner. I repent of my sins and I thank you that you died for my sins. In your name, I pray. Amen. And according to God's infallible word, if you said that prayer and you believe that you are now a new creature, despite how you feel. You can take God for his word. And he said, if you call him, you shall be saved. It's not about a feeling, although you should rejoice. Because now your sins have been forgiven. You're part of God's holy family. You would have eternal life with him. You can have his peace and his mercy, his word. You can have him. You do have him now. And so despite your feelings, it's not about a feeling. A feeling never saved anybody. Your feelings don't save you. Doing what God's words call for you to do, that's believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, you shall be saved that Jesus is Lord, that he died for your sins. And if you did that, I rejoice for you. You should rejoice. And heaven is rejoicing to, for you according to God's word. He did that for you. He died for you. Think about that. God died for you. And the only thing he asks you to do is confess him and believe in him. And if you did that, hallelujah and thank you and welcome to the family. Now, if you've done that, I encourage you to continue to read God's word. Pray to your heavenly father in Jesus name. There's a lot of things you may not understand. That's all right. But as you diligent seek him and stay in his word. He would seek you. He didn't open up his word to you. He will, he will comfort you. He will show you the way. That doesn't mean you just instantly stop sinning. Then that's not biblical. Nowhere in the God's word does it say once you accept him, you're Lord and Savior, that you will never commit another sin. It does not say that. Matter of fact, in 1 John 1, 9, it says if you are faithful as believers now, if you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive you. So what does that tell you? That means that he knows that you're going to sin. That didn't give us a license to sin. As Paul said, Lord forbid. But when you do, when you slip up and you do, you confess and you ask him to forgive you, forgive you, and you get it right. Try not to do it anymore. And that's going to take practice and time. A lot of people get saved and it's not explained to them. And then when they start, when they sin, because you're going to sin because you're in this flesh and the Bible says until you are called home or he return, the flesh and the spirit are in constant battle with each other and guess what that flesh is going to win sometime and because it wins don't mean you lose your salvation but what it does mean that you need to confess it you need to repent say I've changed my mind and not do it anymore and work not to do it anymore and ask for forgiveness and ask for strength not to do it and renew your mind not to do it anymore and continue on the path next thing I would ask you to do in, in Pray to your heavenly father, read and pray about joining a local church, a local church, not necessarily a church building, but a local church. We are the church. Believers are the church where you can gather with other like mind, believe like minded believers to praise and worship your heavenly father and to study the word in more depth. We need that communion. God says we need it. And if he says we need it, we need it. So I would ask you to do those things. Continue to read God's word and listen to podcasts like this where it breaks the word down. Pray to your heavenly father and pray about learning, excuse me, being led to a local church. Because everything that says a church don't mean there's a church of our God. It could be social clubs. It could be a lot of things. And that's why I say first, don't just run out and join a church. Pray about joining a church. 
because a lot of people are getting hurt in church, getting hurt in churches now because they're not true churches, unfortunately. So that's why I say pray before you do that. I just I just thank you. I praise God for you. If you have now committed your life to Jesus and you've confessed it, I, I want to hear about it. Email me at Renew. I'm Brother Honor, your teacher. You're in the host and your brother, brother in Christ. Email me at Renew Your Mind, the letter M at gmail.com. I would love to pray for you. I know you're going to need prayer because the devil's going to attack you like you've never before. He hates when people confess Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And he's going to do everything he can to convince you that what you did is wrong. But you, well, excuse me, a mistake. And that you're not deserving and, and to give up. And I want to pray with you. You can either email me or, or send me a traditional letter at P.O. Box 721143, Jackson, Mississippi, 39272. I thank God for you. Pray for me and I pray for you until next time. Thank you. We pray that this Bible study has blessed you. If you have a prayer request, you can email it to renewyourmindm at gmail.com or mail it to P.O. Box 72. 72- 1143 Jackson, Mississippi 39272. Remember, you can hear current and past episodes at any time on our website of renewyourmindministries.org or on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Alexa, Audible, and Google Podcasts. We encourage you to tell others about the program and share our website of renewyourmindministries.org. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. By telling others about the program, you are doing your part to spread the gospel into all the world about our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Until next time, this has been Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God.